so this is a really interesting review today because this little device right here, the iFi Zendac 2, totally changes what I normally recommend for people getting into audio and looking for their first DAC amp. If even the concept of what a DAC amp is is confusing or foreign to you, I will link an older video up there that explains everything you need to know. Otherwise, stick around and we'll talk about what makes the Zendac V2 a great first unit. You ready? Let's go! The Zendac V2 from iFi comes in at a retail of $159 US. That's a $30 increase over the V1, and that's a really important price point because this is a balanced DAC amp combo. My normal recommendation is that people stretch their budget a little bit and go for the shit Magni Modi DAC amp stack, which can run between $200 as much as $240, depending on where you buy. Add to that another $20 to $25 for shit's own pissed cables, a disgusting sentence which probably just got this video demonetized. Now, that's not a small amount of money and probably not what a lot of people would consider entry level, but my thought process is that it will cover you for a long time in your audio journey, so it's worth stretching enough up front to do it right once and then never have to purchase again. But on occasion, people would emphatically recommend the V1 Zendac in the comments whenever I covered entry level gear. Had I heard it earlier, I would have recommended it over anything I've covered previously on the channel for like 90% of the people out there. I should have reviewed it, but I looked at it and I underestimated it due to its output power specs on paper. That was a mistake, which we'll dive into more in a bit. But first, gotta give a big shout out to Morning Brew for sponsoring today's video. I only had to achieve a pretty modest amount of success before I realized the importance of having a set morning routine. One important piece of that routine is Morning Brew. It's a free daily newsletter delivered to my inbox Monday through Sunday, and it takes me about five minutes to get up to speed on all the major news surrounding tech, business, and finance. You start out with some market news, international stuff, the latest COVID news, finance, etc. If there's something that catches my eye and I want to dig in a bit more, like the situation in Afghanistan or why China's Bitcoin miners are migrating to Texas, then I can. It's on my radar. But more importantly to me, it lets me know what's going on. And if there's not anything I really care to deep dive into, I haven't wasted a ton of time going down a rabbit hole. I used to scroll social media to start my day, and it's just not it. There's way too much opportunity for distraction and to burn up valuable time. Morning Brew is witty, punchy, and straight to the point. There's really no reason not to subscribe to Morning Brew if you're interested in business, tech, or finance and you value your time. It takes less than 15 seconds to sign up and it's completely free. Click the link down in the description to subscribe to Morning Brew today. Big thanks to Morning Brew for sponsoring today's video and thank you so much for your time. One of the biggest changes to the V2 is the addition of a 16-bit XMOS controller chip versus the 8-bit on the V1. It's been included here to support this unit being an MQA decoder. MQA or Master Quality Audio has been a really hot point in audio discussions lately. At one extreme end of the spectrum, it's being viewed as this widespread conspiracy theory this bleeding money from every aspect of the audio industry and all the products supporting it should be boycotted. On the other end of the spectrum, it's largely being accepted that it just doesn't work as advertised. It's a huge topic, and I don't really want it to muddy this review, so I will leave some links down in the description to dive into it more if you're interested. All right, so what we've got here is a really sturdy metal box. It's like an oblong shape. For front controls, we have a power match button, which is basically a high-low gain toggle, so this is a good match for sensitive IEMs. Then we have a true bass button, which helps to fill in some low for headphones that are a little light in that bass department, like open backs. This is a really handy addition because it sounds really good. It's all analog, there's no DSP chip here, but you can just reach over and hit it to turn it on and off as opposed to diving into your full EQ and tweaking. I do this constantly as I'm listening through a playlist that has a lot of different genres of music. Volume knob is big, machined aluminum, it is buttery smooth. This thing feels very high end. The LED behind the unit lights different colors depending on the type of audio input and functions as confirmation that you're successfully using MQA decoding. Front connections are a quarter inch single ended output or a 4.4 millimeter Pentacon balanced output, which is very unusual to see at this price point. Around back, we have a surprising additional Pentacon balanced out and RCA outs. Equally surprising is the fixed variable switch. This is great for desktop speakers or power amps that don't have a volume knob of their own. Again, at this price point, you are generally going to do one or the other, not give you the option to do both. Interestingly, this outputs over the headphones and the externals at the same time, so there is no auto switching headphone jack or an output select button. We have USB-B input here. Still pretty common on audio devices as you don't need the throughput bandwidth of USB-C, and these are very durable connectors. Still, I think everyone would prefer C at this point. I will say the cable is crazy short, like a foot, so plan on using an extension. You do have 5 volt DC power in as well. There's not one included in the box. It is bus power 
powered though, so you don't really need it. That means it's powered over the USB cable. Seeing as how there's no analog inputs on this thing, I'm having a hard time envisioning a use case where you wouldn't need it unless the USB output of whatever host device you're using just isn't providing enough power. Internals are solid. You've got true balance design, got an XMOS 16X chip with custom firmware for the Burr Brown DAC chip. It has a new low jitter crystal clock, which sounds super impressive, but it's one of those things that I can't hear. The big place where this unit lacks is in power output specs, especially when you compare it to something like the shit Magni Modi stack. The shit stack is 200 plus shipping, which was $25 from California to Seattle for two day if you buy direct from shit. It's 240 if you buy from Amazon, and that's before the RCA interlink case which are like 20 to 25 bucks. So split the baby there and you're looking like around $255. We'll call it a hundred dollar difference. Output specs on this are 230 milliwatts at 32 ohms single end and 330 milliwatts using balance. The Magni 3 Heresy outputs an impressive 2.4 watts. That's 2,400 milliwatts at 32 ohms. On paper, that's a blowout. In practice though, I don't have a lot of difficult to drive phones. My DT 1990s are probably my most demanding. The 58X, 6XX, 800S, 8XX, the Meze Classics, the LCDX, the DT1990, all these headphones sound great on this unit. So if you need more power, it means you have a specific, very demanding set of headphones and you know who you are. You're a small percentage of the overall user base. The shit stat gives you additional inputs, coax and optical. It still lacks a 3.5 millimeter aux in. It gives you that substantial power increase, but it also gives you a pretty large necessary power supply. It's not balanced internally, so there's no balanced output there. There is no bass boost setting there, of course. There's no variable output setting there, and the knob is not nearly as impressive as on the iFi unit. My Magni volume pod has just recently started to become noisy in the headphones, which is a bummer. For nearly $100 less for the iFi, you get balanced with dual balanced outs, bass boost, variable output modes, crazy build quality with a small footprint and a single unit versus a stack, which may be a pro, may be a con for you, MQA decoding, which is probably a con for most, and only single USB input. This is especially important for console gamers and you have less power output overall. Of course, if you need the added juice, you can also add the Zen can to make a stack, but it's a $189 increase. That makes the total cost of that stack, if you're using their balanced Pentacon connector, just under $420. That makes it a completely different comparison and a different video. In terms of sound, it has a really quiet background, no discernible distortion. I find it to be a touch warmer and softer than the Magni Heresy, so pretty much right on with the Magni 3 Plus. You'd have to be A, B comparing them to pick out the subtleties. There's nothing apparent there, so you can rest assured you're getting a great sounding unit with the Zendak, especially at this price point. About the only knock I can really find for this thing is that there is a definite channel imbalance until you hit about 10% on the volume knob. In terms of value, the original original version of this was such an easy recommend. It was priced at $130. That's a preposterous amount of value. So what we have here is really the MQA hardware decoding is the main difference for a $30 price increase. And it's hard not to draw a line directly between that price increase and the MQA implementation because I'm sure there's some licensing costs there that have to be made up. And based on the controversy around MQA, that may leave a bad taste in some people's mouths. I would argue that the original was wildly underpriced, but that's how it works with value, right? You can give generously, but you can never take away, even minutely, without upsetting the consumer. Even still, at 160 bucks, the Zendak has a lot going for it. It's a versatility monster when it comes to outputs, but it's lacking in inputs. You get USB and that's it. No 3.5 aux, no RCA ends. It's worth noting too that my PS5 does not recognize this as an audio device going over USB. So you'll need to look someplace else if you're a console user. It handles a wide range of headphones and IEMs and it sounds great. For now, and likely for the immediate future, if somebody comes to me asking about audio around the $150 mark, this is the recommendation. Unless, of course, you need console support. For everyone else, this is pretty much a one and done until you hit that four to $500 tier. All right, I think that's it. Thanks so much for watching. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Stay up.